today we are at the 30th annual St. Lucie County History Day competition. This year's theme is debate and diplomacy in history and our middle and high school students have been doing research to learn more about topics that interest them. Today we are judging the exhibit category where students showcase their work in a display board. We have done judging virtually for our more technology based projects like our documentaries and websites. We are so proud of our students for all the hard work that they have done this year. And I did my exhibit on Florida's bloody election of 1920. It presents the debate over voting rights. It raised issues such as racial attacks and racial threats of violence. On November 2nd to the 3rd, 1920, there was a racial attack on African Americans residing in Coy, Florida, found northwest of Orlando. It was an attempt to stop African Americans from voting. These tra tragic events are most, re most commonly referred to as the Coy Massacre. It was triggered when Mose Norman and others attempted to vote. It all started in the 1900s the town of Okoye, Florida. Most government officials in Okoye were members of the KKK, a terrorist hate group that targets Republican leaders, various races and religions, and supports ideas such as white supremacy and racial segregation. On November 1st, more than 200 people marched down the street, streets of Orlando to warn African Americans that there would be serious consequences if they tried to vote. On election day, Norman tried to vote but was turned away, therefore went, went to John Cheney for help. Cheney told him to go back and try again, but instead he went to Perry to tell him he was not going to continue to do this. Later, the KKK found Perry after he too tried to escape and was killed. The next month, various civil rights groups presented what had happened to Congress so they could investigate, but it was unsuccessful and found that the people's rights were not violated. Although most killings happened the night of November 2nd, there continued to be killings the following days. Although the exact number of African Americans who died that day is not for certain, it is estimated that over 50 were killed. In the 1920 census, there are approximately 256 African Americans residing in Okoye. By the end, of the year they were all gone either because they were killed or they simply fled. There were many false reports about the killings. For over six decades, Okoy remained an all-white town. Today, people remember this as the deadliest election day American history. Many people still to this day wonder what actually happened that election day. Various museums have created exhibitions to educate people about this devastating event and to inform people on African history. Non-proliferation of nuclear weapons treaty is about how they're trying to ban nuclear weapons from being traded, from being given to people used and from being used and tested from around the world. And in 1970, the United States, the UK, United the UK, Russia, and 59 other states joined. And in 1992, France and China joined. But in 1995, the treaty was indefinitely and without conditions extended. And now they're including the nations and countries. There are now 191 in total. Now, the thing about China and France is that China at the start didn't want to join and sign the treaty because they thought that it was against, well, it was against everything. 
and it was imperialism. France was fine, but just didn't want to sign the treaty and just followed what the treaty said. The treaty did allow for, for peaceful n nuclear technology like nuclear power plants to be used, but not nuclear weapons. Plutonium was actually really easy to get in the 1960s for some it, because it was just everywhere. In the treaty, only five uh, nations could use it, and that was Russia, the UK, France, China, and the United States. But everybody, all the other countries, thought it was unfair, and that started some tension between them, which didn't help the treaty, but it still stopped nuclear weapons from spreading. Um, my board is on the bath riots, and I chose to do this project because not that many people knew about it, and also has to deal with a lot of issues we have now regarding immigration. And because in the bath riots, many people had to go through um, delousing and like kerosene baths, which are really unsafe. They cause respiratory issues along with its being a fire hazard. And one day, a girl, Carmelita Torres, decided to protest against it, which car started a whole protest. And it ended up leading to an act in 1917 where people go crossing the border and made it harder for them as a result of the protest. Um, they had a passage of a National Quarantine Act in 1893, which led to a typhus outbreak infecting many people in the Mexico area, which started a lockdown and had the El Paso mayor want to have many people like quarantined and inspected. But it was really unsafe because his idea of getting rid of typhus was, gas was gasoline and many harsh chemicals, which ended up leading to a fire in a prison where many people died. Um, in, in the 60s, they had a Bracero program, and they used DDT, which later found out to cause many issues to the workers, where they had cancer, vision issues, and respiratory problems. They later on um, decided that it was unsafe for many people to use, as many people, even their children, were being born with defects. My topic is the Keating Owen Act of 1916. And in this act, it limited the hours that the kids of child, that these child laborers could work. It limited the days that they could work, and it limited the places that they could work based off their age. And these child laborers were kids anywhere from the ages of four to 16 and there were a lot of kids that were working in harsh conditions like they were they were like miners they were oil workers they were seamstresses and they worked in a lot of hard places and that was why a group of people they formed together and they made the Keating Own Act to stop these kids from working so hard that they have no childhood left in them um, the Keating Own Act had one part in it that said any product of child labor cannot be sold in interstate sales. That meaning that any products of child labor, say a kid picks Georgia oranges, that means that they can't sell them to Florida. And a justice or a judge named William R. Day, he said that you, this is unconstitutional for our country and we can't have this. So he wrote the opinion for the Supreme Court that declared the law unconstitutional in 1918 and stopped the law from happening. But this law is very important because it was kind of the stepping stones to the laws that we have today for labor. So like later on, maybe 20 years later in 1938, there was a law that was very similar to the Keating Own Act. Instead, it just didn't have the part that talked about interstate sales not being allowed. And then later on, it kept going and kept going and kept going. And then now we have the laws that we have today. And not only do we have those laws for kids, we also have laws for work, like adults, like the amount of hours that they can work, the amount of days that they can work. So the Keating Own Act was a very important time in history. And it's important that we study it that way that we learn from our mistakes and learn what we build it on. And my topic is equal pay. Um, 
My thesis is that women should have equal pay because they weren't treated fairly. Their pay was a lot less than men and they weren't treated like adults. Um, the difference in the pay gap made women angry and they decided that they should start and fight for equal pay. Uh, many women started writing letters to the president and then a woman named Esther Peterson decided to go talk to the president. Even while women were sending letters, equal pay didn't seem to get better. But when, equal, when Esther Peterson talked to the President Kennedy, he decided to make an equal pay act. And even though many were made, it only it took a few years before one of the drafts finally made it. The equal pay act uh, was passed, and many jobs started paying equal pay for women. My topic is important in history because it talks about the struggles that women had to go through. And even though equal pay still isn't perfect, there's a lot of jobs out there that have equal pay. Um, the, our projects that we did is on the Olive Branch Petition. We, it all started with the build-up to the Olive Branch Petition, which included the Grenville Taxes of 1764, which included the Molasses Act and the Stamp Act. One of the biggest things that ticked off the colonists to doing the Olive Branch Petition, which was a final attempt at peace before the Revolutionary War. One of the biggest things that ticked them off was the Boston Massacre, which happened when nine British soldiers actually killed three to four hundred uh, um, co colonists in the streets of Boston. The intolerable acts were laws passed by British parliaments in 1774, and they was meant to punish the Massachusetts colonists for the Boston Tea Party protests. And the intolerable acts were the were the Boston Port Act, Massachusetts Government Act, Administration of Justice Act, and Quartering Act. In September of 1774, the first Continental Congress created to pledge support to Massachusetts. And the Proclamation of Rebellion of August 23rd, 1775, King George officially declared American colonies to be rebelling against Britain. <laughs> Delivered two days after the Olive Branch petition was received, um, December 6, 1775, Continental Congress responded saying the colonists were always loyal to the king and Parliament never had authority over them. Led to the Declaration of Independence to be written in the Revolutionary War to continue. The Olive Branch Petition was actually went through two drafts. The, the final draft was made by John Dickinson in, in July 5th, 1775, but the first draft was actually written, written by Thomas Jefferson, and they actually changed it, changed it because it, they feared that it would just anger the king even more. Um, so in conclusion, the Olive Branch Petition was a last stand effort to um, avoid the inevitable revolutionary war with the British Parliament. It went through two different drafts and in the end still failed with the creation of the Proclamation of Rebellion. There were many attempts before this to stop it, but all those attempts but one fa ended up failing. Um, my project is charitable. I have debate in diplomacy levels here. And for my project to fill empty space, I decided to put it in a nuclear background. It's a nuclear power plant in the background. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, here's my intro. The women and men were working vigorously, but then people were getting extremely sick and the cause was unknown. Unfortunately, it was an explosion and a malfunction occurred that caused that explosion. That incident is now known today as the Chernobyl explosion. For that diplomacy, that brings me to diplomacy, it brings you to a high level disaster. And the first diplomacy signed or is the Intermediate Range Nuclear Force Treaty, which was signed in 1987 by President Ronald Reagan and Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev. This treaty spoke of the destruction of ground launch ballistic and cruise missiles with ranges of 500 to uh, 5,500 5, kilometers. And so, signed due to the parameters of Chernobyl and how it affected everyone else, which also led to the collapse of the Russian economy as seen there and consequences. And my next treaty that was signed was the Arms Treaty, which is another turning point for Russia after Chernobyl. And here it was the entire fleet of nuclear weapons eliminated, again, destroying their economy, because that's where a lot of their money came in, and failures here. 
um, they care for the equipment, that's how the explosion was caused. The failure to dry sturdy material also caused failure to notify the public, which resulted in food poisoning, deaths, and suicide. That's a big thing here. And my debate, what's always the cause always varies on the source, like one source will say human incompetence, and the next will say it's the reactor itself, picture. And then my last debate here is that the, call, that the impact will never truly be known because t even today, Chernobyl has continued to affect Russia and places like Ukraine, especially with um, what's going on with Russia and Ukraine as of right now and their war that's starting. And you know, it always says 31 people died, but it's really more than 100,000, a debate. And that concludes it. My project is on gunpowder diplomacy, and I will also be talking about co colonialism and uh, the debate based off of if, if it was good or not. <laughs> so first, we start off with Captain James Cook. Um, he was an English explorer who has circumnavigated the world three times. He, on his first voyage, he had traveled from, he started from Great Britain, and had traveled down past South America and then eventually ended up near Tahiti. Um, during his time in Tahiti, he met the native islanders there and nothing bad really generally happened around, the, around Tahiti. Um, he also met up with people in New Zealand and during that point, um, well, the Maui's there didn't really have a great time with him. They're kind of hostile. So he had tried trying he had tried to be diplomatic and not hurt anyone with uh, chicken shots, which were used to hurt people, um, but not actually kill someone. But this didn't work. And so he had actually eventually murdered some Native Islanders in Maui. This had actually given him the image of someone, of somewhat mystical, like as if he were a god. And so he was able to trade with the people in Maui due to that image. Um, so later on, he traveled back all the way to Great Britain. And that was the end of his first voyage. Um, now the second and third voyage both have to do with trying to find the continent, or supposed continent, of Terra Australis um, Incognita, which, they, which the Royal Society had theorized was the balancer of our world. Of course, this wasn't the case, but they were actually correct that there was a continent um, above Europe and under Australia. This was, of course, North and South Pole. So Cook had obviously tried to go down past the South Atlantic Ocean and into where we would find Antarctica later on. But that couldn't be the case because of all the glaciers and ice that had built up all the way past Antarctica here. So all he could really find were ice and penguins. <laughs> so that was generally what the third and second voyage were about. But the last voyage, which is in blue here, had him traveling to do the same thing. But later on, he would end up in Hawaii. Oh, sorry. <laughs> he would end up all the way in Hawaii. This is where he would find Native Islanders there, but they were also very hostile. And his gunpowder diplomacy worked at first. Um, he was seen as a mystical figure, and he was treated very similarly, similarly to how the Maui's had treated him back in New Zealand. But his one fatal flaw was that he had taught the Native Islanders there in Hawaii how the gunpowder worked. And once he did that, they figured out that he wasn't any mystical god that rose up from the sea or anything. So because of that, they had eventually ended up murdering or killing Cook and a lot and about half of his men. 
the other half survived to tell the tale and also went on to be significant explorers later on in life. But Cook and his friends were, ironically, well, after they had died, cooked. They were eaten, but it was a common burial practice back in Hawaii. Um, so after figuring out Cook's voyages, the question comes up, is colonialism good or bad? And was gunpowder diplomacy flawed? Yes. It was very much flawed, or that is why I'm debating. Um, gunpowder diplomacy has good and negative effects. Yes, it, it allowed Cook to stay alive and have a somewhat positive relationship with Native Islanders at the time, yet it also ended up with him killing a lot of people. He had in fact used cannon fodder to, um, f and used cannons to fire upon uh, islanders and their homes. And this most likely killed a lot of innocent people. Did it allow him to survive on the ocean and gain supplies? Yes. Did he build relations with most of the native islanders? Yes. But did it also lead to him murdering people and possibly spreading diseases unintentionally or intentionally? Yeah, it did. So I would take the stance that it is in fact not good. Colonialism also had was was very much impacted due to Cook's adventures in Australia up until the 1970s. People native to Australia had been stolen away from their homes by the Australian government and put to live with the people there that were white. They were stolen away and their culture is now almost forgotten because of this. They're called the stolen civilization or the stolen people. This is just one effect of colonialism and something that Captain Hook, Captain Cook had impacted. Colonialism had also been impacted by Cook in the falling in the falling islands of Tahiti, of Tahiti and New Zealand. While he was able to build relations there and also able to interpret their language, he was also he also caused those people to go through slavery, mass extinction and genocide later on in life, and also caused those people to be used by other countries in Europe. This is one of the biggest causes for why colonialism is very much wrong and has impacted history in a gruesome way. Um, there are of course also positive sides to what colonialism had brought the natives. That this allowed, colonialism had allowed native islanders to be given new technology, medicine, they're allowed, they're given knowledge about the world around them, and they're also schooled in math and science. Yet, this cause and effect that colonialism had also brought them was almost the extin extinction of a lot of native islanders, um, of their history, really, of their people, of their culture, everything. So colonialism is definitely, it's, a, it's definitely a very um, <laughs> debatable topic. There's some positives at the time for this and a lot of negatives at the time, and even now that we can see. Okay, so basically, the, the name of our topic is Kill the Indian, Save the Man. General H Henry Colonel Pratt was an American military officer who founded this program. And the program was very brutal. Um, a lot of children, 10 children died in this program. Children were beat because they, were, we, they couldn't use their Indian names or wear their Indian clothes or 
um, participate in any cultural or religious rituals and if they did then they were be by or usually under the threat of physical punishment so there was actually 25 schools open like all around the world and a bunch of them they were just very um, harsh they would beat them with whips and uh, hit them physically and some of them there was an economics class they would uh, teach young ladies young Native American ladies to be white Americans and they would have to have uh, tight clothes and they would need to be taught how to cook clean and be a yeah be a housewife basically and a bunch of this was from Colonel Pratt and he believed that whitewashing them was good and just taking all their culture away from them was the best way of doing everything. After Pratt's death, um, the government announced that they would be closing the Native American school. In its 39 years of existence, they finally decided to close it. Um, there were a total of about or more than 17,000 Native Americans that were enrolled into the boarding schools. Uh, here's a quote of a young lady or a young girl who attended the school with her father and her father um, died because being hit and yeah abused. And this is just her memory of her father, how... And some of the students died, about 10 of them died, and a, a couple were from suicide. So the, they were finally returning home after 100 years under government expense, put in private, uh, private funerals and private cemeteries chosen by their family or under the government. My topic is segregation is not for schools. Brown v. Board of Education was beneficial to America because it helped school districts to desegregate and entitled all students to receive a quality education no matter what their race is and allowed students to attend schools near their house. Um, before Brown v. Board of Education happened, um, African American children and white children were um, separated and they went to two different schools of the races and African Americans had the not so nice school supplies while the white had the really nice ones and they learned better. Um, during this, the NAACP, they were a group who um, fought to end racism and um, during this, um, African Americans had to walk or ride a bus really far to get to their school, even though there's a white school right around the corner from their house. Um, some of the main players of Brown v. Board of Education was Oliver Brown. He was one of the 13 plaintiffs, and the plaintiffs are um, the parents of the children who dealt with us, and they took a little bit st a step further, further to... Um, to end it and some of them lost their jobs and had really big um, problems. Um, another person who was very important with this case was Thurgood Marshall. He was uh, um, the lawyer and he, yeah, Earl Warren, um, he was the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. He made the decision to end segregation and to desegregate. Um, when this um, when this solution happened, people in uh, um, Arkansas were very annoyed and mad about this, so they did not segregate. They were very mad at this. Some unintended consequences was that um, African American staff, principals, teachers, they were fired from their jobs because the school district didn't have any jobs for them. When um, segregation in schools ended, the Civil Rights Act um, happened, and um, African Americans and whites they're like, if children can get along with, if children can get, can get along and share stuff, maybe we can get along and stop fighting. So yeah, that's it. Okay. Thank you. What's your name, your school, and go right 
My project is Scientists vs. Salvers Protecting Flora Submerged History. To, I have I've conducted this research to figure out which which sign if the scientists or the salvagers you get to get to keep the artifacts. During during my research I I figured out that in the past they used to work together so I feel like they should work together now so they can get things done quicker and they both get what they need. I found out that the famed treasure hunter Mel Fisher ha has found a famed tra um, ship na named the Tocha, and he figured out a way to make the art that the artifacts that he found, and figure out a way to be both scientist and salvage th theories. He made his pri he made a private mu museum that you that you can visit with some of the treasures he, he found at from the Itocha and then and he also got to keep some of the treasure he also got to keep some of the treasure. Uh, my in my conclusion I feel like the scientists and the salvers should work together like they used to in the past because in the past they worked very well together but now they are divided so it's hard for them to work together so they are now arguing figuring trying to figure out who get, keeps the ar artifacts found, found from Spanish galleons and, uh, and other Spanish fleets. Um, our project is on the Seminole Wars the fight for Florida so this has to do with the uh, history theme topic of debate and diplomacy because the Seminole Wars were about obviously the two different sides the Seminoles and the US. The US was upset at the Seminoles for taking in runaway slaves which caused the first war and they were also upset and they also wanted the land that the Seminoles had so that was the cause for the second war. The third war was just a continuation of all this frustration and anger within each other. The Seminoles had lived happily in Florida until the U.S. tried to like push them out of their land. So this caused most of the wars, like the U.S.'s want for just expanding their territory. But the first war was fought over like wanting to have those slaves that the Seminoles had harbored. The long-term long -term impact of this would be the decline in the Seminole population as it declined significantly. Um, originally there had been about 100,000 indigenous people in uh, Florida at the time. However, it decreased to about 3,000 to the current day whilst the population in Florida is in the millions. So it's still to this day has greatly affected the Seminole community and its people. As for the visuals, we have um, a bunch of pictures. Um, some are primary sources, such as paintings like this and that one too, but some are just second-hand um, photos, like this photo of like important battle sites and this photo of Seminole reservations. And we have a replica of Chief Osceola's headdress that he would wear. Up here we have a picture or a painting from the time of the general uh, Andrew Jackson. He later became president. And uh, there's also pictures here of uh, runaway slaves that were in the Seminole tribes. And down here there's a picture of uh, old Seminole territory and chiefs. Uh, these are the battles that occurred, paintings of the battles. And then this is the chief himself, Osceola. And this was when they captured Osceola. Uh, here's another Florida map. And here's the Seminole tribe today. And my topic was Title IX in women's sports. I chose this topic because I'm a big advocate for women's sports and I've been playing since I was two years old. Title IX was a law enacted by President Richard Nixon that states no sex shall be discriminated against 
based on any federal funded activity. The two debates that rose from this topic was, should this money apply to only educational programs and would it take away the spotlight from men's sports? However, both were debunked by the help of Billie Jean King, Patsy T. Mink, and President Richard Nixon. As, an, as a result from this um, Title IX, there has been a 45 545% increase in percentage of women playing college sports and 990% increase in women playing high school sports. Also, many influencers and experiences have aspired from this and have definitely influenced many young girls today to play sports. And this is our project, the Tulsa Race Massacre. The massacre began after 19-year-old Dick Rowland, a black shoe shiner, was accused of assaulting 17-year-old Sarah Page, a white elevator operator. At the Drexel Building, during Memorial Day weekend. These are the events that follow. The Tulsa Massacre was one of the deadliest riots in U.S. history. Black Tulsans tried to rebuild their new homes and businesses, but it was never the same due to the, due to the increased segregation and the newly established KKK branch in the area. On May 31st at 6 a.m., Tulsa Tribute publishes a headline saying Nav Negro for attacking girl in elevator, causing several black leaders to begin organizing for the possible necessity of defending Roland from a, from a lynch mob. The police also prepared to repel a, lynch mob, a possible lynch mob. 7.30 p.m. A crowd of white curiosity seekers had formed around the courthouse. In total, there were around 800 men, women, and children gathered. 10.15 p.m., OB man, an armed black man, was demanded to put down his pistol by an elderly white man. Man refused and the old man attempted to disarm him. Man shot him. The gunfires triggered almost an immediate response with both sides firing at each other. 10.30 p.m. As gunshots were being fired, African Americans started running back to Greenwood. Along the way, bystanders, many of whom were leaving movie theaters after a show, were caught off guard by these mobs and fled. Panic set in the white mob began firing at crowds of black people. 11 p.m. At around 11 p.m., members of the National Guard unit began to assemble at the armory to organize a plan to subduce the rioters, the National Guard rounded up numerous black people and took them to the convention, convention hall on Brandy Street for detention. At around 1 a.m., white mobs began setting fires, mainly in businesses as the news traveled around Greenwood residents. Many residents began to take up arms in defense of their neighborhood, while others began, to, began a mass exodus of the city. 5 a.m., throughout the city, Throughout the early hours, groups of armed white and black people squared off in gunfights. A rumor circulated that more black people were coming by train from Muskegee to help with an invasion of Tulsa. Small groups of whites in brief for forays by cars into Greenwood, indiscriminately firing into business and residences. 12 p.m. Overwhelmed by the large number of white rioters, black black residents started retreating north of Greenwood Avenue on the edge on the edge of the town. As terrified residents fled, chaos ensued, and rioters continued to shoot and kill many re residents along the way, splitting into small groups and breaking into houses and buildings. 12:30 p.m. Shortly after the National Guard and government. JBA, JBA Robinson had declared martial law. It had effectively ended. By the end of the event, 1,256 houses were burned, 215 others were looted, but not, but not torched. Two newspapers, a school, a library, a hospital, churches, hotels, news, and many other black-owned businesses were among the buildings destroyed or damaged by fire as well as 6,000 people were taken into custody and held at the convention hall and fairground, some as long as eight days. Okay, so what's your name, your school? And this is my project on nature versus nurture. Uh, I chose to do this topic because I thought it was out of the box, and when my teacher told me that it didn't have to be just a black and white history project of an important invent or an important person. It could be something that we enjoyed ourselves. I decided to go into a, psycholo a psychological topic. Um, so my project goes into detail on the origins of the topic, the man who coined the term uh, nature versus nurture, which is Francis Galton in 1874 in his book. However, the topic has been shown to throughout history with um, 
debaters such as Aristotle and Plato. Uh, my topic goes and talks about its impact and it explains why the topic has been so hard to find research on as there is no set evidence that you can find on whether nature is correct or nurture is correct. So now in modern times, uh, scientists have discovered that nature and nurture are both equally as important um, to uh, cater towards uh, when raising children. Uh, also, a little fun thing I did is I put Frankenstein on my project because uh, Frankenstein, when he was created, his inventor didn't put forth the effort of raising him and showing him the ways of human life to the point where the town and his creator like disowned him from the area he lived in, which is uh, showing how your, your uh, nurture side, your environment has created you into the monster that you are.